Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gatineau and Professor Renato. And I would like to thank the entire Oculus family for giving us this platform to share our experience on the Pentagram OCT and something on cataract and refractive surgery. Uh, so yes, uh, technologies have evolved over time. And we started from Placidos in early 80s. And then uh, when it came to shine plug based imaging in early 2000s and biomechanics, our life became just simple. Like we knew that 95% of the times when we are doing our refractive surgery based on this biomechanics and topography, which comes from shine plug based te technology, we, we can go trust them and choose, a choose the right procedure for our refractive surgery patients. However, there are times which comes in our practice where you see an absolutely normal topography, but sometimes your biomechanics do not match with these topographies. And sometimes your uh, topographies look healthy, but the bad D values uh, are sometimes suspicious and you have a healthy uh, biomechanics. So what would be the right approach in such scenarios? Time and again, uh, it has time has shown us that as we move on, we have to evolve over uh, every year, year and it is a relentless march of evolution as we move on in our refractive surgery practice as well. So when it comes to refractive surgery or when it comes to any cornea surgery, it's not just like looking at your topography or biomechanics. At times you have to give importance at every layer differently, which will be your epithelium, your Bowman's layer, your stroma. And for corneal surgeons, Dua's layer and endothelium also play a very important role. So. I'm going to go layer by layer for each of this layer, how Pentacam OCT has been fruitful in our practice when it comes to cornea refractive surgery and cataract. So this is a patient, uh, looks healthy, a topography, but when we did the, like you can see here the bad D is 2.06, and you can see that there is a small anterior elevation in the left eye, however, the right eye is absolutely normal. So having experience for many years, we knew we what we were looking at, but we wanted a proof of the pudding. And the biomechanics as suggested here is absolutely normal with good SPA1 and CBI. So when we did the epithelial mapping, you could see that the right eye looks fine. But in the left eye, even though the corneal, uh, the epithelial thickness, thickness looks fairly normal, but the central epithelium has started thinning. And compared to the periphery, you can see a value of 45 or 46, and the peripheries are 50, 51, and 52. So you are actually looking at a donut-shaped epithelium here. So what does it signify? So we went ahead and looked at ocular surface changes. It does signify ocular surface changes. So we did a keratograph for this patient, and you could see that uh, this patient has a gland uh, grade 2 gland loss both in the upper and lower leads, uh, lids and if you see the tear film stability it's an in uh, it's an instable uh, tear film you can see a lot of dropouts in your tear film as well so probably the epithelium changes are coming from because this patient has an ocular surface issue and underlying dry eye though the tear film metrics are normal uh, but a keratograph and uh, does help us pick up why the epithelium is a donut shaped epithelium in a healthy topography and why your bad D is borderline. So adding an epithelium in refractive surgery just helps us decode what we were missing in those suspicious values. Now, this is a second case. Uh, tear film matrix looks uh, again normal, but you can see that there is a smile inferior steepening, but there is no correlation of it to the anterior elevation or posterior elevation or even your thin pachymetries as well. So again, doing an epithelial mapping does sh did show us that there is a little bit of uh, hyperplasia in the inferior region uh, for this patient, and that could correlate with the inferior steepening what we have been seeing. But is it a red flag sign? Should I operate? this patient or no? Why does uh, this patient have a thickened epithelium? And should you just overlook and go ahead with a refractive surgery or should you just reject this patient for a refractive surgery? So we do a lot of this confocal microscopy to understand what it is. And this white cells, what you see here, are all the inflammatory cells. And this patient uh, had nothing but if you see this irregular epithelium had an, sorry, had an underlying inflammation in terms of this dendritic cells. And if I go ahead and operate this patient, if I operate a healthy epithelial patient post-surgery, there's going to be a regular epithelial remodeling 
uh, and going to have a good quality of vision. But if I just go ahead and do a surgery in this irregular epithelium, then this patient may have a poor quality of vision because post-surgery, the epithelial remodeling is going to be erratic. So pre-operatively, if you have an irregular epithelium, it just tells us when to operate, when not to operate. But that doesn't say that you don't uh, do a surgery for this patient. Just pre-treat the patient with probably a thermal pulsation therapy or an IPL therapy, and you can see how nicely your tear film has improved from preoperatively being, being abnormal, and you can see now how healthy it is. And this will help you to choose the right procedure. You can probably go ahead with a lenticular extraction procedure, but just go with a deeper cap, and this is how post-surgery the epithelial remodels in this patient. So. Adding an epithelial mapping in your practice is probably not uh, telling us to not do a surgery, but it is telling us which would be the right patient to do a surgery and when would be the right time to do a surgery in this patients and what procedure. So epi understanding epithelial thickness patterns and dynamics of epithelial remodeling is going to become an essential skill for every refractive surgeon as you move on in addition to all of the other things. Uh, Sir has beautifully covered how comparable it is to other technologies. So yes, it does have a beautiful uh, advantage in terms of axial resolution in the tissue. Uh, the number of B scans, the radial scans done here are also uh, in the Pentacam OCT are also on the higher side compared to that of Solix and MS39. And the scan length is also 70 millimeters compared to that of 10 which comes in Solix and CSO and these are just some comparative maps and you can see they are uh, matching quite uh, well they are repeatable and reproducible when it comes to uh, your epithelial thickness in different quadrants but the added advantage here is that it's a nine millimeter of epithelial thickness and it doesn't extrapolate the data but it gives you the true epithelial thickness what it has to be uh, coming to Bauman's uh, thickness, now a lot of times when you do a lenticular extraction procedure, uh, there are times everything's gone perfectly fine, your topography biomechanics are fine, you've done a surgery, Every the surgery has been uneventful, but then you have a set of patients who have wow vision post-surgery, but then you have some set of patients who, are, you ha who have 20-20, they have 20-20 vision, but they're not happy with the quality of the vision. So what is the missing link? Again, because of the resolution of the OCT, you can very beautifully look at how the Bowman's is. And the patients who, uh, the, the left side of the patient who did not have the wow vision, if you see on day one, uh, you can see that there is no retained lenticule. It's an even, inter uh, even nicely merged interface, but there's a lot of Bowman's wrinkles. So, and it has been well published over the uh, very, like many years that if you have Bauman's wrinkles to begin with, then this patient can have a poor quality of vision. And this is very well seen and a lot in your lenticular extraction procedure. So what you were seeing here is not a fault with your topography, biomechanics, or your surgery, but it's the distortion of Bauman's membrane, what you see. How could you prevent this? Can you prevent this? Yes, it, you can. What you can do is uh, when you're just doing a surgery after you finish extracting your lenticule, you just go ahead and iron your uh, cap uh, just maybe five to six times with saline and a very soft uh, spatula. And if you just do that, you can see that the Bauman's wrinkles just disappear. This patient was unhappy, so we did a uh, ironing for this patient, and you can see that there are no Bauman's wrinkle or minimal of that, and that leads to sharp quality of vision for this patient. And also sometimes uh, it helps us to diagnose whether it's a healthy Bauman's membrane or a thin Bauman's membrane. As we move on, we know that in a very early ectatic eyes, the Bauman's can be thinner. So because of the precision of the OCT, the 1.9 microns uh, scan depth, you can actually make out what is the, the whether the Bauman's membrane is thinner or a healthy Bauman's membrane. And if it's a thin Bauman's membrane, you would probably go ahead with a surface ablation and not a less surgery. Uh, doing a lot of lenticule procedures, it also helps us to identify the shape of the lenticule. But more than that, if you have a suction loss intraoperatively, uh, this is a patient we where we were doing the flap, patient was squeezing the eye and we had a suction loss. Uh, but if you see here, you can't make out much, but when we did an OCT, we saw that there was an entrapped gas bubble and it was 
it, it did start disappearing, but uh, we have to find the right time when it disappears. And once it disappears, once you can confirm on the OCT, you can reschedule this patient along with a flap procedure with a deeper cut and not the same cut. And this is what you see post-operatively, that there is no surprises and you can have a good even flap navigation with OCT. Um, yes, with suction loss, this patient has a suction loss. Uh, it happened after the, like it happened just when the posterior uh, surface was being created. So we did not know whether it's a, it's a well cut lenticule both for the anterior surface or not. So we just did an OCT after the OBL disappeared and you can see both the anterior and the posterior planes have been very well created, but the incision is not made. So next day we went ahead and just um, did an incision for this patient and we could remove the entire lenticule and this is what the OCT looks like on day one with complete removal of lenticule, no retained lenticule and a clear cornea. So OCT does helps us in navigating whether to go ahead or not and what is the right time to go ahead with the surgery. Um, with, uh, because of the high resolution, we are able to see, uh, measure the speckle intensity and how the keratocytes look in each layer, the anterior, mid and the posterior. And because we are able to look at the keratocytes, uh, if the keratocyte density is on the higher side to begin with for a PRK patient, uh, probably this patient is at more risk of having a uh, haze post-surgery. And if it's on the lower side, then probably the patient will not have haze post-surgery. So the, the keratocyte uh, distribution with this high resolution also helps us a lot. Sir has already covered about corneal transplant, but yes, uh, with these images, it does help us whether the patient is eligible for a dark or a full thickness penetrating keratoplasty. And even if you're doing a, uh, let's say a lamellar keratoplasty, an anterior lamellar keratoplasty, whether you can do your big, big bubble technique or not, and whether you are going to able to dissect it off beautifully well or not. So OCT just helps you pre-plan your transplant surgeries and also have troubleshooting back in your mind while you're operating the case. So that's how it helps you. Um, and yes, because uh, it has a perpendicular structure uh, to uh, structure to the corneal surface, we are very uh, nicely able to image the duas layer. So sometimes it's very difficult to image the duas layer, but because of the perpendicular structure of the rays uh, for this OCT, uh, we, we are able to image these layers and that that has a very important role when it comes to acute high drops in keratoconus. So that's what also you can see, which is sometimes missed otherwise. Now, being a refractive surgeon, being a cornea surgeon, a lot of these patients would require a cataract surgery as you move on. And you do have a lot of this post-refractive surgery patients or keratoconus patients coming in for a refractive surgery. So, um, as we have the Pentacam AXL wave, uh, the, the life has become very beautiful because you have a shine plug based uh, uh, imaging where you can see how the topographies, you have your EKR maps. But more than that, beyond that, uh, because it can measure your axial length, uh, you can plan your cataract surgeries. And the axial lens with IL Master and IL Master 500 is very much comparable to that of Pentacam AXL wave. You can plan your special condition patients like you have, you can, you can plan your toric IOLs, uh, you can plan patients with corneal scars, uh, patients with post refractive surgery, if it's a myopic surgery or a hyperopic classic or a RK patient. And it helps us very, helps us beautifully well to have a IOL power calculation for each of these patients post refractive surgery. And these are the conditions where you can actually edit everything and plan your IOL calculations for your cataract surgeries as well. So to conclude, yes, uh, we are moving towards unlocking new dimensions in corneal assessment, a unique fusion of Scheinflug and OCT technology. Uh, the spectral domain OCT images along with the Scheinflug uh, technology helps us image the cornea layers with high resolution and precision. It images the duas layer also, which may aid in advanced keratoconus and cornea transplant cases. And it gives us a valuable data when it comes to keratocyte density, so it can tell us what would be the right patient for your trans PRKs or not. So being with Pentacam family, being with Oculus family for a very long time, I can just say that our we are moving towards an era where we can say together, we are complete as a family. And I would like to thank my entire team, which is back home who's helped me put up everything together. Thank you.